we need to cherish our stories um, and the journeys that we have. I think that they're like wonderful and like they can be really empowering and hearing like having heard lots of stories and having shared my story with different people like that act of sharing stories is like hugely empowering it builds community like we find strength in it we can relate to each other um work through experiences that we have like maybe not solve whatever oppressions that we're living through or struggles we're fighting but find strength that other people are existing in that always kind of been a constant sort of like there was always this sort of undercurrent of uh, perseverance. I was very what they would call now a gender independent child. Um, In the beginning I came out as a lesbian to everybody that I knew and my dad actually found out once he was in the car he was like so do you have a girlfriend and I was like really uncomfortable because I had no idea that he knew. Discovered my identity. I haven't yet. Um, it's an ongoing process. When I was first, you know, like a baby trans person, I uh, I would s- try to make myself more masculine and like I would like correct the way I sat on the TTC just so I would like look more manly and stuff. And that was really really hard. And I had people call me like an asshole. Like my friends close to me, they were like, you, "You're acting like a macho guy. Like what's what's this all about? This isn't you." Um, and then that really like shook me up. And I was like, "Oh man!" So I really started to dial back, you know, and just concentrate on being myself. In some ways it's kind of fun, and and in some ways because, like, I've been able to play tricks on people, gendered tricks on people sometimes. I was getting awesome radical concepts into my life saying, like, yes, you can determine your own gender, and it can be whatever you want, but then I had to also dig through the years and years of me having really sexist, binarist understandings of what gender was and trying to, you know, have those conversations of like, do I just really not want to be a cis woman because I've internalized misogyny and I just hate femininity and what it means to be a woman. I was hanging out with other two-spirit native people for years and they were always like, are you sure you're not one of us? Are you sure? I said, well, I could ask my mother, but she'd probably get really mad at me because I've approached this topic before and it was like, nope, I don't want to talk about that. Too shameful. Because back then, you know, when I was growing up, it was pretty... You weren't taught to be proud of being very native at all. You were taught to hide it and be ashamed of it. So it was pretty terrible. I'm just so delightful, delighted now that it's not that way anymore, that, um, that uh, people are encouraged to find that out about their background and celebrate it. I've been met some elders who have told me, you know, even if you only have one drop of native blood in you, you should be proud of it. So that's how I view it. And it's caused some talk in my family about exposing all this history that was hidden so long. Um, yeah, so I guess I'm just a shit to serve from, from birth. <laughs>
I thought of myself as a girl and a woman growing up for most of my life. And when I was young, I would have fantasies about being a boy, but I figured that most children have fantasies about being in the opposite gender and it wasn't you know, any big deal. And I figured there's nothing I could do about it. So what's the point in really letting myself want to be a boy? I don't know. Gender always felt to me sort of like some kind of personalized, like, I don't know, it sounds awful. Haunting has like really awful connotations, Maybe, or it's like a, a dream you're always having. <laughs> I always did everything that like all the girls did. I was like, I played with dolls, I wore dresses. I like did up my hair and put on my makeup, like I and and like I still kind of do that sometimes, and I don't really think that like it's wrong because it's what I like to do. At one point, um, one of my friends asked me, "They're like, do you like being a girl?" And my answer was, "Well, I haven't really experienced anything else, so I can't really tell you if I like it or not." Uh, as soon as I came out, I looked for other people who were more uh, gender um, in the non-binary and trans as well. And it was definitely like a, it was like a community, a group of people, you know, that came together to discuss what they're going through. Um, so I definitely feel like there is a group of people that, you know, come together to share their experience. My binder came in the mail one day, and what I said to Krista at that point was absolutely the truth, which was I really thought that I was going to put on that binder, put on a shirt, look in the mirror, and say, nah, and go back. And then I would go back to being a short haired dyke and everything would be normal again. And that is not what happened. What is gender? We don't know, but we know when it's wrong. Do you want to tell people where we're going? Oh yeah, sure, we're going to the Trans March. It's the New York Trans Pride event in Washington Square Park. Community. Is that with an asterisk? Of course there is. There, there's, there's no, there is a trans community. There is a non-cis community. I have to first define what is community. And for me, uh, my definition of community is a, uh, a network of people that associate kind of around some idea. Connected isn't the right word. I would say that they are they're in, they're meshed together. I think I don't feel part of the trans community because I don't know enough trans people. I feel like I'm part of a trans community uh, that I sort of make myself. Like, I feel like I have trans people in my life. A lot of them know each other, a lot of them don't. I guess in that question I'm also hearing like a little bit of a statement about community. The community is a word that gets thrown around a lot. Definitely like in different work that I have been part of, people talk about the LGBT community or the trans community. Like it's this like monolithic center or like, you know, we've got some hall that we go to every Friday night and we just, you know, talk about our Packers and hormones and get drunk and that I mean no doubt there are places like that but there I don't think there is like any one place. Queer is an umbrella term that I think covers a lot of trans. Um, and certainly my general non-binary sectors of trans use queer oftentimes as an easy go-to to mean non-normative. The non-trans queer community has a long history of throwing trans people under the bus. Yeah, I've heard, um, well, I've gone stealth. <laughs> so I've heard things said about trans people by other queers, other gay people, that were pretty horrific and horrendous and disgusting. 
I feel like the gays and lesbians, especially the white ones, don't want anything to do with us most of the time. So even if you are a lesbian or, or gay or bisexual, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are okay with um, people who are not in the gender binary. The word of what it means to be queer is just used so like broadly that like if someone says like, hey, this is a queer space, I don't go there at all assuming that that means that they've thought about transphobia, um, or what is sexism, or transmisogyny at all. The people who are trans, whether they're transgender or transsexual, coming to the gay bars, there is like these sort of social expectations of them that they are either, either, either they're trannies and they're like prostitutes, or trans men, or like, you know, they're, like, they're fake. They're not real, but like all these different things, and it's like sometimes it's not sad about it, it's just all the subtle things that happen around. They don't really understand what it is to be trans, and they don't know what questions are okay to ask and which ones are pretty inappropriate. There are people who identify as trans who also identify as uh, homosexual or bisexual or pansexual or whatever sexuality they want to deem themselves to be because sexuality and gender identity are two completely different things. Be them interrelated, they're not the same thing. When I was trying to date girls, like some people would just straight up not want to date me because I was trans. They're like, oh, I don't want to date a lady with a penis. Like, that's not cool. Yeah, you know, I mean, how many times are you at some kind of queer thing and there's like a gay, you know, like a gay dude who just says, oh my god, if I have to see another vagina, I'm gonna barf all over myself. You know, stupid crap like that. I feel undateable. I feel like I can't get, get hired for jobs. I feel like I'm not included in the circle of queer, cool people. You know, there, there's a saying that a lot, it says, um, um, all humanity is part of one body. And if one part of that body is aching, everybody's aching, right? So it's Farsi, so it kind of gets loose in lost in translation, but um, to me that's the way I see it, being queer and trans and everybody in, in the one umbrella, right? community and on Sunday nights we had silent worship and in silent worship um, God talked to me and God gave me a word for my gender and a word for my body and a message that I was okay and you know I didn't have to leave religion and I didn't have to stop being all about Jesus I wasn't all about Jesus um, and that I was still created in the image of an amazing, amazing being. And then I spent a year not telling my wife and we got married and I still didn't tell her. <laughs> and I, it took two years to tell them. Can you define gender for me? No, no, I don't think so. We define gender on one hand um, as this sort of like system of norms and behaviors that sort of is defined culturally and that's sort of imposed upon us. Um, and then I think we also talk about like gender identity and gender expression um, as being like ways that we relate to that system. It's kind of a deep dark maw that no one ever comes out of alive. Um, I think that every day I realize my gender identity, so. My poor mom, I must have come out to her like five separate times as like five different identities. You know, I did the whole like I'm bisexual thing. And then after I broke up with my boyfriend, I was like, I'm a lesbian. You know, I'm a, like, you know, I feel masculine. I must be a lesbian, you know, stereotypes. And then, and then I was like, and then 
I would feel weird when I would try to date other girls because like it was like a gender identity thing it wasn't a sexuality thing so I told my mom I was asexual and then I told my mom I was pansexual again and then I was like okay I'm I'm a trans guy but I'm straight I'm totally straight trans guy and then I came out again and I was like I'm just kind of I'm a guy but I'm just really queer I was at a Tony Roni's which is like a pizza place out here in Philly and I was with my dad and my mom and I was like trying to explain like gender and like the binary and how like some things are non-binary and some things are fluid and um they were like oh well that's cool and then I started crying and <laughs> I was like but gender and they're like okay whatever and my dad just like continued eating his breadstick and was like so what do you want me to call you and then I cried more. I was socialized like uh, really masculine I mean, like, my dad uh, tried to get me to like uh, football, but I do kind of like football now, but, like, uh, I was never really allowed to do girly stuff, and I'll admit, like, uh, you know, I can be a little butch, but since the age of 24 and uh, since when I uh, dropped out of, uh, when I was forced out of grad school, and, of course, I had nothing left to lose and my disability was getting the best of me, I decided... Fuck it. I'm not gonna like, uh, I have nothing to lose and I'm not gonna waste one more moment in this, uh, gender role that was forced on me. So, at a summer camp in West Virginia, an adult summer camp, mind you, I just raided the costume tent on Jul and on July 12, 2009, the, that boy whose, uh, name I shall never reveal died and that girl Jordan was born. Uh, we have a highly stratified culture and gender informs our everyday experience. We walk down the street, the first thing I see when I, first thing I think when I see someone is man or woman. Even as a trans person, that's the first thing that pops into my mind. I got the shit kicked out of me a lot in school for being a sissy, for doing such and such like a girl, runs like a girl, throws like a girl, looks like a girl, acts like a girl, kick it. I knew my gender was different. There was just not really a space for me to be different, I guess, exist differently. Being a part of the trans community as an intersex female, I cannot allow them to use their cisgender privilege or ideology um, to, to belittle me, nor can I let the hypocrisy of trans sisters and trans brothers affect me either.
I'm adopted, and I'm the only non-white person in my family, or well, my relatives, I should say. And I'm also um, the only one that's not by blood and generation, so I'm already black sheep on that. And I live here in a, outside of suburbia, Texas. Um, I'm very close to rural Texas. It's uh, about 15 minutes that way. And um, I have more acceptance with cisgender, heterosexual men than I do in the gay community in inner city Houston. I would play checkers with my great-grandmother when I was a kid. And when she was getting older, and just, just um, her, her memory was failing her. And I, I remembered that I was always the red pieces and she was always the black pieces. And that's how we played for years. And I remember when we were playing, um, she picked up the red pieces instead and started playing the red pieces. And I remember just sitting there. And I looked over at my grandmother and my grandmother noticed it. And, um, and she looked at me and she says, winning isn't everything. It was that moment that I realized that um, I sometimes having compassion for people and understanding it, even if they do something wrong, it, you, you pick and choose your battles. It is really amazing. Um, I have a, I have, you know, like my, my real family, my chosen family, um, and to watch them step up and go to bat for me and be alongside me, mm -hmm. that has got to be one of the most amazing. Um, amazing things that I've seen because it it's um, it's that outward acceptance that we all need. You know, when you spend your whole life living in the suburbs and you aren't even allowed to say gay in your own house because it's a bad word, everything just seems so dark. Everything just seems so shut up and it's like you're afraid to even be a little bit of who you are. But like, you know, when you meet, you know, all these people, you know, it's like a whole new world sprouts out. It's important for me to to remain true to myself and keep reminding myself and I I find strength in community and seeing other people doing just that and staying true to themselves despite what other people around them tell them and despite what their socialization has told them and what everything what they've been told their whole lives what I feel is an important part of the fight too is uh, going to someone who is, you know, on their third drink at midnight going, being trans is a one-way ticket to being unloved and dying alone. And, yeah, um, and just being like, no, let's talk about this and let's have you not be alone for the next little while. The, that, that I can do that, to me, is a really important part of the fight back against the people who made her feel that way, who made anyone feel that way. I remember um, I was, I had a new, because I deal with a lot of refugees, um, particularly like uh, queer refugees and trans refugees and I remember I actually had to yell at a social worker about all of this because um, this was a social worker dealing with newcomers and they had no idea how to deal with a trans person. So I actually like, I got so upset, I had to go and like school them basically on this whole issue and I'd be like, listen, there's more in this community than um, just gay and lesbian and cisgender people. And uh, basically what had happened was that they had uh, told this person that they can't find a shelter for them. And this is the issue that trans people usually deal with with shelter because this was a trans woman and they wanted to put her in a, in a guy's shelter and obviously she wasn't feeling comfortable with that. I was supporting this trans youth who had just come out and their parents were not happy. And their parents uh, wanted to send them back to their home country and force them into a marriage to try and make them straight or whatever. So um, there was a whirlwind of events and I got thrown in a cab uh, from Glenn Murray's office, the like politician, and sent up to North York, 
where I would never go on my own. And I had to go into this family court that had already closed for the night, and I was there for hours arguing with the judge with like no actual lawyer with me or anything, and no real legal standing at all, trying to prevent the parents from forcibly removing this child from the country when they didn't want to go. And um, the judge gave me two options, the first of which was that I could get the child to tell the judge directly that they didn't want to go. Or, failing that, I could apply to adopt the child, and we couldn't get in touch with this kid, and the judge gave us one hour to get in touch with this kid, who like has no phone, um, is only sporadically on the internet, and all these other things, and their parents are such a barrier to getting any kind of communication. Um, and just as the judge was walking back into the room, I got an email from the kid, um, saying that, yes, this is what they wanted. Uh, and if I hadn't gotten that email, I probably would have actually applied to adopt this kid just to stop this, like, horribly transphobic thing from happening. You try to think about, like, the big things you did, um, but I think about the thousand little victories. Um, getting a police officer to have a number after they say something shitty and uh, transphobic. Um, going to uh, uh, open doors day for like a fertility center and being like, okay, language kind of needs a work here, you know? Um, creating space for trans people at, uh, at venues. Uh, Ottawa just had, for instance, the uh, Snowblower uh, Festival, which is like their gay men. And there was a workshop there specifically for uh, trans gay men. And, you know, creating that space. And those little victories add up and make a huge difference. I do like to do what I can for the community. I do like to get my voice out there. And I do think it's important to educate people. I try to do it almost from a stealth perspective. I don't know, like, I'm alive. Does that count? <laughs> You know, like, I guess just the fact that, like, trans folk and all their variety and diversity are existing and living their lives, like, to me, like, I don't think we give trans people enough credit. Like, that's enough. Like, you are just awesome for doing you. And, like, you know, I think that that's a really important piece. So just, like, to me, like, trans survival is resistance. <laughs> trans men that are very, very binary are kind of pushing out like the gender queer and gender non-conforming people and it hurts me. I see a lot of internalized transphobia actually and that's not really that surprising considering we live in a society that makes us feel like shit for being who we are. Like I remember <laughs> I was out, uh, this is back on Trevor Space, oh god, like I have so many weird stories but I remember I wanted to dye my hair. You probably can't see, but I had like a little bit of bleach part here that I, you know, wanted to dye a color. And I remember asking on the board, like on the message boards, like, I want to dye my hair a fun color, but I want to be able to pass. Because back then I was like passing, passing, passing. Like I have to pass. I can't have fun. I have to pass. And I was like, I want to, I want to dye my hair a fun color. Is there anything that I could dye it that would be kind of masculine? And I remember the first response was a trans guy. And he's like, guys don't dye their hair fun colors, so maybe you should be reconsidering whether or not you're a guy. Or like, something really awful, like not maybe that exact wording, but it was like that sentiment. I just remember it scared me so bad, because like, when you're so young and you're so insecure, I was like, oh my god, maybe this changes everything. Maybe because I want blue hair, I really am a girl. Like, and I just completely freaked out. I certainly can't really feel like there's a 
trans community as a sort of broad based thing after the like amount of trans misogyny that I've experienced at the hands of trans men. Even within communities, there are still different um, intersecting oppressions that come into play there. And so it can be really dangerous to talk about the trans community when there's still so much trans misogyny that's present even within the trans community. And there's so much racism still present within the trans community um, or really biased understandings of genders. One of my own experiences was, oh uh, man, uh, it was racism and transphobia wrapped into one. It was, oof. we were, um, we went out for drinks with uh, a couple of friends and um, there was this guy who was, uh, uh, actually he was supposed to be like an activist and uh, really hardcore on certain issues, you know, and uh, so we go, we're watching um, a drag show, we're enjoying the show, it was a nice show, and uh, <laughs> we had this uh, performer who was a trans woman of color, and she was just doing an awesome job. I was like, yay, enjoying the show and everything, and uh, having a couple of drinks, and he's like, I don't think black people can pull trans off very well. And as soon as I heard that, I'm like, oh my God, like I just needed to walk out and just take a deep breath before I come back to what just started. Yeah, this is back in Trinidad. I was, I was hanging out with a friend of mine and a friend of his who owns a, not really a bar, not, not a gay bar, but like a bar that happens to be owned by a gay man. And they were talking about a really well-known um, a drag queen in Trinidad. And they were like, well, we don't know what pronouns to use. So is it he? Is it she? Is it it? So they started referring to her as shit as their pronoun, which is, I mean, that was just staggering to me. That is so dehumanizing. Um, and this was a performer who a few months later was actually beat up because she was transgressing gender norms. There's multiple separate trans communities because, frankly, trans people of color um, and white trans people do not really overlap. We go to some of the same events, but we don't really interact with each other, and, and that's, frankly, mostly white culture's fault. Like, trans community often ends up just being trans men community, or white trans guy community. Uh, why are we so hooked up on this? You know, we're, we're a minority within a minority, and if we don't have each other's backs, and, and if, if we don't understand each other, then, you know, how, who's gonna, who's gonna, you know, fight the struggle for us? I guess I'm still in. I was high and watching Kiki's Delivery Service, which is a Miyazaki movie about an anime movie about a uh, uh, adorable young girl witch who um, leaves home to go to work and she starts a delivery service. Uh, I was watching her and I felt myself getting jealous. I was envying her. She looked really free. Um, and I was like, am I high, or do I want to look like a teenage girl? Uh, even when I was four years old, I would tell people my name, and they'd be like, what did your parents give you a girl's name? <laughs> That's really funny. And then when I got older, when I reached teenhood, I turned 12, well, before my teens, I guess, and I started growing a beard. And, Paralyzing is to become feminine, like uh, most female assigned people my age, I guess. And um, so that caused a lot of consternation in my house, in my family, in my school. But um, 
I was lucky. My family was very supportive. They took me to a lot of doctors, but they didn't listen to most of them. <laughs> One doctor told my parents, oh, don't give her female hormones, she'll grow up to be a lesbian. And this is in uh, 1972, 71, so, you know, lesbians weren't cool people they are today. <laughs> there was no Ellen, there was no Albert, nothing like that. Lesbians were considered like the bottom of the pile, lower than drug addicts. My parents, you know, generation's eyes. So it was pretty terrible for my parents to be told this, and I got kind of coerced into taking these hormones, which made me feel really terrible, like a cow. Like, blah, 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 blah. It just felt horrible. So I stopped taking them on my own, just didn't tell anybody I stopped taking them. And then I got it. The beard started coming in, and <laughs> the questions at school every day, are you a boy or a girl, are you a boy or a girl? On and on and on. It wasn't really that they wanted to know, it was just like a way of, you know, saying you don't really belong here, you know, we don't like you. I was on estrogen for a while, and then my mom died uh, when I was 18, which was really an intense experience to go through, because I wasn't connected with any of the rest of my family, and I dropped out of school because of um, transphobic bullying and homophobic bullying that I faced, um, and I, it, it had left me with like PTSD, so I could not function if I was in a school environment, and um, so it was kind of like, oh crap, now I have nothing going on in my life. Almost a year to the day later, I went to Thailand, where I had um, sexual reassignment surgery, vaginoplasty. It's a thing, it's a great thing for me, not necessarily for everyone, it's a good thing. Um, and uh, yeah, and it was really weird though, the timing of that, because it was almost a year to the day that my mother had died, and she had died almost a year to the day that my grandmother had died, and I went into surgery, I went completely by myself to Thailand, I was 19, um, and I went into surgery completely convinced that I was gonna die. And I remember they were wheeling me into the operating room and I was crying because I thought I was gonna die for sure. And um, no one spoke English at all. And so I couldn't tell anyone about that. And I was all on my own and I was just thinking, even if I die, this is still worth it. This is just something I have to do. There's no way that I can't do this. I was working three jobs to support myself, uh, putting myself through college. And I was also, at that moment, I had decided that the best possible thing for me to do was, and I was like, look, I can make my parents love me again if I just live my life as the gender that I was under birth. If I do that, everything will be resolved and we'll be friends again and they will be nice to me and life will be good. Um, and so that was probably the worst year of my life. And at a moment, I, the real turning point was, not a lot of people know this, now it's gonna be on camera, it's gonna be kind of awkward, I tried to kill myself. It was my birthday. I turned 21. And one way, one, way, one way or another, that didn't work, obviously I'm still here. And I was like, you know what, this isn't working. Um, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to transition right now. Honestly, I I don't tell her this, so she's going to be hearing it for the first time. I actually am one of those people that, like, looks completely normal. Like, well, not completely normal. But, like, you see me on the street and you're just like, oh, he's a fucking confident dude. Like, awesome for him. But I get home and I'm just like, like, after I get off the phone with her, if I'm not, like, too tired from, like, my entire day, I just, like, ball my eyes out. There's always that kind of bug in the back of your head, that voice in the back of your head, like, you're not good enough type of thing. And I don't think that ever goes away. Responsible mother gone 14 days 
return to smother and smolder. I told her, I told him, function through feeling. Being away, earning and dealing, my heart in it, accused, really. Being away, earning and dealing, my heart in it, accused, really. Hey, I'm James Darling, and my pronoun is he. My pronouns are they and them. Gender is the idea of um, like different kinds of roles that you take in society given to you at birth, like whether that mean you know like certain kinds of behavior patterns, clothing, uh, you know, mannerisms of speech and movement. Like these are all things that people find like inherent in a in a gender. Gender, I don't know. Whenever I start to think about it. It just makes my head spin in circles. Where I grew up was very conservative, and in my family, everybody's uh, there's no trans people, uh, there's not even anybody else who's queer, and so it was you know very very rigid like ideas of like what made a man or a woman, uh, and yeah, and like especially the town I grew up in and stuff like if you fell outside of those, then bad things happen to you. So that's. Uh, yeah, kind of putting it lightly, but yeah, for lots of people I know, you know, like men aren't supposed to cry, you know, women are supposed to like dress this certain way, or, you know, the list goes on and on and on. It's not really like it's super overt, but it's just like non-inclusive language. Like one of my gay guy friends was talking about like, like a penis is really important to me, and I'm just like, but, you know, not all dudes have penises or, you know, like, what you would consider one. Trans community? Um, well, yeah, I believe there's definitely a community. It's changed a lot since when I first came out. Like, when I first came out, the, uh, I saw, um, what was it, Southern Comfort Convention was, like, what was available to me, and the kind of people who came to that were often um, a lot older stealth men. And, like, the way most people kept in touch with each other was through, like, kind of semi-secret, like, meeting groups and, like, listservs and uh, that kind of thing. And, like, even in the past five years, it's just amazing how much um, trans people are able to find each other more easily. And, like, I do feel like there's a certain online community that's forming. I hope there is one. That would be really cool. Like, um, I'm kind of hoping that once I get into college that I'll, like, meet a small group of really queer people and can be super queer together. I definitely find power in my resilience and the kinds of situations and experiences I've had to go through in order to become myself. Um, I definitely feel like I'm a very adaptable, uh, resourceful person, so that's definitely where I find my strength. Wearing makeup. I like wearing makeup and I like drawing and, you know, just Wearing stuff that makes me feel kind of powerful. Forgive your skies, they're not okay. Have to sit and watch you pray. The sun, it just won't shine today. Well, I don't blame it anyway. What keeps me going is just seeing the, the, the things that I see, seeing the injustice that I see, and feeling like the work is not even half done yet. I can't lose the number of times I felt safe from successes in the transphobia. I felt safe from transphobia before the I get on the subway and I get laughed at and I get called faggot boy and I get called queer and everything else and I've reclaimed those words but it still hurts to this day to hear them from other people. I was wearing tight black jeans, five inch stiletto boots, and a really deep V yellow American Apparel shirt. And I was walking with a friend, it was her birthday. Because of what I was wearing, it was very, it wasn't as easy to get a cab 
and this is Young Street on a Friday night. It's and first we couldn't get the cab, and then like people were making comments as we were walking in the street with her. I was like, you know, who wears pants in that relationship? We both do. I was feeling really shitty uh, going through Craigslist ads, desperately searching for intimacy. <laughs> um, and while like, looking at the ads, I felt really shitty because all these ads were about like bodies that were not me. Actually, they were all the complete opposite of me. And like that basically made me feel like I was totally undesirable and totally not worth anything. And this is why I have so many issues with the queer community, actually. Um, in particular, I would see the messages, no fats, no femmes, no Asians. I hit all three of those. I get a lot of strength from learning about stuff that other trans women of color have done and are doing. I got involved with the AIDS movement and met some really cool guys through there, activists, and they all had AIDS and they all died. And I was with them when they died, some of them. And being with them, going through that process, I um, realized what's really important in life is to be yourself. And they told me that, so, because I was so busy taking care of you, I didn't have time to shave. So my beard came out and they were like, wow. You look just like a bear. <laughs> You're so cute with that beard. So I thought, wow, that they can accept it. And I'm like, I'm just gonna start growing my beard and not being ashamed of it anymore. You know, it's called LGBT for a reason. I use the paradigm a lot of times um, of a sandwich. If you like lettuce, tomato, and cheese on your sandwich, then your sandwich is not complete without your lettuce, tomato, and cheese and the trans is that tomato. The homosexual is that lettuce. The bisexual is that cheese. We need all of it to make the sandwich. And if you want to criticize one part of your community, then you're cutting your own throat. And it's really easy to play into that and to want to do that. And you can get a lot of, like, sort of more short-term validation for your identity in that way. And that could feel really good. But, you know, maybe after, you know, like, I, I shared some personal stories with some university classes a while ago. And, you know, at the time it felt really good. But as time passes, maybe, maybe I don't want to tell those strangers those things about myself. I mean, I don't want them to know that. You know, and I feel glad that it wasn't like a Globe and Mail article. But I think, like, being careful where we put those. And, like, do it. Asking yourself, do I really want people to know this about myself? You know, in five years, am I going to want them to know these things about myself? And sometimes you can never tell, but... I think I'm you know, not playing into this idea that we need to share everything with everyone um, and finding other ways to, to cherish and validate those stories and experiences. The greatest lesson of, of transition is exactly what my, what my great-grandparents and my grandparents have been teaching all along. And that is remember who you are. The truth is, for me to make my life better, I had to make it better. What you ask for is what you get in life. Nothing is black and white. Get money first before you do anything. Money up front, especially if it's sex work. Oh my god. And the best thing I ever did was learn to give everyone the middle finger. Give people the finger, it will help. The people who tell you to be yourself are full of shit because those are people who um, have the luxury of being themselves without facing violence. Um, so I would say, just be. Yeah, just make it to tomorrow. Even if you're not in a place to fully 
be who you are, generally that space can be created. I spent a while going, it's okay, I don't have to think about this right now, I'm doing other things. It's okay, I don't have to deal with this right now, it's not like I have a significant other who will be affected. It's okay, I don't have to deal with this right now, I'm a student, that doesn't have a gender, right? Uh, it's okay, I don't have to deal with this right now, I will just put it off for the near future, and maybe I'll get hit by a train tomorrow, and none of this will matter. And I did that a long time. <laughs> and now I'm sort of making plans as if I'm going to live for another 20 or 40 or 80 years, and it's been nice. <laughs> I've been told repeatedly by my therapist, like pretty well every single week, of, uh, how resilient I am. But that comes about due to the massive, very support, intense support network I've developed over the years. My parents and my family as a support system have really empowered me to think independently and to really believe in what I think. Doing things that are just for myself like writing a diary, uh, talking to friends, surrendering myself to the idea that I do not have to be any one thing at any time. I have to, to some point, like block out what other people think. The more that I put up this giant wall, the more insecure I felt because I could just, I knew who I was, but it was like, I was afraid. Also, I like to look at myself in the mirror and tell myself I'm fabulous because I'm fabulous. <laughs> Life wasn't, no. <laughs> um, I don't know, just be happy for yourself and do good to the world and do good to yourself. You know, don't take yourself too seriously and like, you never know what funny can do. <laughs> I usually find my power um, through being alone and I read a lot. Also just a lot of books and like reading books by like radical queers like Esper Bergman and Kate Bornstein and like um, a lot of those folks who've kind of come before and are still playing with gender. Music. Being passionate keeps me powered, so I try to surround myself with things that kind of drives that passion. I guess in discovering my two-spirit, my two-spirit history, my two-spirit identity, that gives me a lot of strength. I am. Um, Educated myself about the uh, uh, four secret medicines and calling on the directions. Well, I educated myself about that, and talked to elders about it, and that gives me strength. I meditate every day. I burn sage or sweet grass when I need to. I'm a musician. I'm a music composition student, um, and a lot of a lot of my work is sort of really explicitly centered around transness. Um, and, and around queerness. And that's always, that always feels like a really liberating thing. Being trans is not really a big part of my life. Um, I'm just me, and that's just a part of me. I wish someone would let me know that like, they're there and like living their lives happily. And sometimes I feel like, I wish I could let people know that I'm here and that I'm trans and that I'm would would help a stranger, would like talk to someone I don't know, or would just like, it just helps to see other trans people doing anything, I think, for me even, you know. It's absolutely normal and all right to feel shame, but th there's genuinely nothing to be ashamed of. The life lesson that I would like to share is that it can get better sometimes, it can get worse sometimes, and you always have yourself. Just do what you want, and then they'll suck it up. Do what scares you. Embrace Just yourself. Embrace yourself early. Just be yourself. As painful as it might be, and as much as you care about what people think about you, just be yourself. Never give up. You know, just plain and simple, never give up. Living in South Jer in rural South Jersey, they tried to put me in a box, and if they couldn't keep me in the box, nobody could. In general, Christian belief, you believe that, uh, you know, you should accept your body and be happy with how you were made and to change yourself. It's like you're trying to play God. And that was really tough for me to grasp because I was so um, strong in my belief in Christianity. And then to feel transgender was really conflicting. But I've come to a point where I can find peace. And, uh, and I feel like this is a 
a journey that I need to be going through so that I can kind of spread that. There is space for everyone to worship or not in the way that they need to, in the way that they want to. I just know that I was made by a creator intentionally to be exactly what I am. And I believe in a creator that trusted in me to be a co-creator with them, to like create and be fully present in the world and just keep creating and keep giving, you know, me to the world because I'm a gift as all human beings are. Uh, we're not outcasts, we're legendary creatures. We're like unicorns, we're mythical.